Good morning. It's, fr it's Friday night or Thursday night, whatever it is at the Golden Door. And we're happy tonight. We're here with Paula Crevache. And Paula Crevache launched her first collection of one-of-a-kind art jewels in 1981. Her awards and achievements took her as a jeweler very quickly to the forefront of modern design. Combining the disciplines of fine art and gemology and a history with jewelry transformed her into a fresh, unique talent. So the first question is kind of obvious. When did you decide to become a jeweler? It was a simple twist of fate. I was in India, but before I left for India, I had dabbled in jewelry making in my undergraduate school. Graduate level, I focused on painting and sculpture. I get whisked off on my magical mystery tour to India with the late, great George Crevache, a fabulous scholar, and I'm living in the heart of India's a gem and jewelry district. And it was called Lakshmi Road, and that's the goddess of wealth. So all the jewelers had to be on Lakshmi Road. And I started to learn from their ancient metal smithing techniques, and I started to get so fascinated. So I had four years in this magical mystery tour without coming home, and we went to Sri Lanka. You stayed in India for four years? Four years. Wow, how was that? Fantastic, it was everything. Were you scared? Never. I was never scared, I was enthralled, I was inspired, I was sometimes saddened because there was a vast mm -hmm poverty to, that you could not ignore, but yet there was a richness that would never ever fade from this ancient empire called India, the wonder that was India. So I was very inspired there to begin jewelry making, and what was the biggest impetus is that after this four-year period, we come home and there weren't jobs in the humanities George was a PhD in Buddhist philosophy and linguistics. I was an artist, and he got, could get a job in Calgary, Canada, but he didn't like the cold. No, it's pretty so, cold there. <laughs> it's cold. Definitely different than India. <laughs> so we just decided that we would go into rugs and stones, and I'm an artist, so it doesn't matter what my medium is, and that's how I began. Wow. So when you think back about that, what was the, what was the sort of, um, how can I say this, what, what held you back or what was the hardest thing to accomplish in the beginning to get started? There's always that first step to become a jeweler. It will be the funniest answer. It won't be what you're expecting. I designed a small collection of one-of-a-kind pieces. I've stayed to the one-of-a-kind my entire career because I'm an artist and I don't believe, in, I believe in just doing your original works. You don't mass produce. So I got this collection together, and I am not of the merchant class, so I really didn't know how to go about that part. That was the hard part. So I made some appointments for downtown Boston. Oh my goodness, this should be fun. Yes, <laughs> and so I'm knocking on this door, and this gentleman comes out, and he's looking at my work, and he wanted to know if I knew the, the work of this great Italian goldsmith. And I said, no, actually I don't. And he goes, stay right here. And he shows me the book and he said, this is who you're going to be. And I think I should buy your entire collection. And I thought, oh my God, I can't sell him the whole collection because then I won't have anything else to sell. And I, I mean, I was that naive. I, was, I promise this is a true story. So I go back home and my father-in-law and mother-in-law were coming for dinner. And my father-in-law said to me, well, so how did it go? And I said, well, he wanted to buy the whole thing. And he said, that's fantastic, darling. And I said, oh, no, I, I, I kind of talked him out of it. <laughs> and he's like, oh, my God. He said, honey, let me tell you how to close a sale. Oh, my goodness. You say, how would you like to pay for that? <laughs> Cash or charge? <laughs> exactly. No, exactly so that. That was the toughest battle for me. How fun well, for Was you. that merchant thing, because I, I just didn't understand it. I, I didn't understand it. I was very naive. That m many years later, now I know you do. I understand that it's wonderful to have that exchange. Exactly. It's healthy and it's happy and it's joyful, but I didn't know that at the time. So when you're thinking about jewelry, what comes first, the idea or the stone? The stone almost 99.9% .9 of the time. And I have a wonderful uh, way of doing that that's always been my custom. I take the center jewel 
and then I'll put it down on my, my um, desk and I'll start mapping out its size and shape and I draw the shape but I'm holding it as I work and it's very intuitive process and things just flow but I'm always holding that center gem it is the heart of the jewel you are often referred to as the queen of color first of all how did you get that name well it was I heard that I was the queen of color for the first time when I was in Las Vegas our big the world's largest gem and I mean finished jewelry show and um, I was coming out of Wolfgang Puck's restaurant, the Post Rio or one of those, or I forget what it was, Spago's at the time maybe. Anyway, my, the whole press of the industry was there and they said, were your ears burning? And I said, well, not really, but why should they be? And they said, well, we've just dubbed you the queen of color. Nobody uses color the way you do. And so that's how it started. And I won a lot of awards for my work in color. I was a painter before I was a jeweler, so I literally paint with the light of the earth. So what are your favorite gemstones? Oh my God, it's like, who's your favorite child? <laughs> you do not have There's a favorite. There's so many beautiful stones in the world. <laughs> yes, and so you love them all. But I do have uh, ones that have occurred in my work from day one that I could not live without, which are opals. I have on an opal bracelet. I love opals with a passion. I think Mo it looks like Monet painted them or some other impressionist. They're just such works of art on their own. I love tourmalines and moonstones and sphalerites and sphenes. I love them all. I really do. I, can, I couldn't really pick an all-time favorite. Well, I'm such a jealous at heart. I'm one of those kids who had the rock collection, you know, but it didn't mm. look so pretty. It was always just the big chunks. Yeah. What? Let's it, share with our guest how you go through, because you're not getting them all polished and beautiful. No. No. You're getting them in this, like, like you had as a kid, you know, the little box with all the little rocks in it, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting them rough. So how do you know that that stone is going to be so exquisite? Well, my late great George, who was this incredible scholar, ended up discovering that he had an innate sense to see the stone. That is a through gift. The, get, through the surface. Through the, through the whole crystalline wow. structure, right. he had the gift. And it is a gift pan-Asia, pan-world. There are some that can, but they are far and few between. So as fate was kind to me, which it always has been around this work, so I know that I'm destined to do it. George, having all seven, seven, seven Asian languages, reading, writing, speaking, while we were touring and going in, getting involved in this, he became very interested in the mineralogy and the gemology and the cutting. So places like Harvard Mineralogical Museum were commissioning him to find the rarest, the finest of things that really are so rare on earth. And he could just go find them. He spoke the languages, he could make people laugh, the seas parted. So I learned so much during that time. How does he find him? Well, he would he go, goes out with like a guide and, you know, he's shifting and... Well, he... No. Like we don't know, right? No. We don't know. How does oh, he that's actually true. do that? Well, he, he called himself a source master, so he would go with this language skills and find out who were the mine owners. And he would meet mine owners. And then he would speak in their language. They'd have us for lunch. There were piles and piles of sapphire crystals, for example, after lunch, the envelopes for these gems would be about this big. They'd open up and there were piles of them. And then George would start high grading. And you, you develop an eye. You have to know what to look for. What is the finest? What is jelly? But it's an art. It's a science. It's all of that. And he was such a brilliant mind that he absorbed all that very quickly. And we traveled all over the world. He went to... Um, Africa, mm -hmm. he went to Sri Lanka. And every country has its own gemstones. Exactly. Of the, the alluvial deposits that deposited when the, when the whole continental divides and the earth was doing its magic ended up in Serendip, Ceylon, Sri Lanka as we know it today. And so we flew into Sri Lanka, and at that point in time, it had the finest, the widest variety, and the finest quality 
of the, most of the gems on Earth. Is that right? It was really. So let's, let me understand that again. Mm -hmm. So because you know Sri Lanka is on the bottom half of Africa. No, no, no. Right? Sri Lanka is the pearl of India. It's at on the, the tip. It's an of, island. It's a, it's its own island, and it's I've shaped actually like been there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's the shape of a Baroque pearl. It's so beautiful. But why did they? Why did the geological factors affect that spot? It was just the way I. I. I you know, I don't know if I can answer you um, specifically that way. Way I understand it, it's just everything kind of settled. Isn't that interesting? In that area, and. Now we have it going on in Madagascar where there are the new finds, the best and the major quantities of the finest and a large variety is now occurring in Madagascar. Is that right? Yeah. Another yeah, interesting But island. formerly it was Sri Lanka. For a long, they had a very long run. You still get some very fine material. Princess dyes blue sapphire, for example, is a, a Romuka blue and it only comes from one mine location in Sri Lanka, but you, you it, now it's, it's in Madagascar, and so the, the Sri Lankans are now flying in and staking areas what? to collect the rough in Madagascar. So it's now so global, we're all so connected now, but you go where the rough is coming, and that's the beginning of it all. Are there gemstones yet to be discovered? Oh, constant. No, I know that's a hard question to answer, but it, if no. you think about today's 2015, has there been oh my gosh, this newest gemstone was just discovered and it looks like this. Exactly. Well, the Earth is so prolific and it is constantly creating new material. That is why it is exciting. so exciting, exciting and so fascinating and held the attention of a great scholar that could master a lot of things because he couldn't master that and he was always looking for that next Exactly. Gem. We all are. Of course. We get excited when we find them and they do come. They keep evolving. The so Earth what is are the most popular stones? Uh, if there's such a question. Well, I would say you know, term, many people just adore tourmalines. And what's so wonderful about the tourmaline is you have over 300 recorded colors. So they're, they're just, uh, and they're durable for wearing and setting in jewelry. But you have your classics, you know, the emeralds that make a swoon, the rubies, the sapphires, all those big boys that you think of as like the cashmere sapphire and the stories and the lore of all these amazing gems through the centuries that have continued to have that ripple effect even in today's society we 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 long for and pine for certain things but um, there are so many beautiful colored stones and we're learning so much more about them and they're becoming more in the mainstream and understood i had a lovely lady at dinner who said You've heard of spinels, haven't you? And I said, oh, I, I covet those. I love those. And the Royal Crown of Jewels has the largest uh, red spinel on the planet, and it's, it's in the Royal Crown of Jewels. And they always called it the Black Prince Ruby, but it was always a spinel. And, and until uh, the, the science of gemology evolved enough that they could decipher the difference. Oh, my gosh. I read that on, when someone was describing your work, that there is a timelessness to your designs and that you identify your work with somewhat a newer point of view. Is there a muzz or an inspiration that you keep coming back to over and over that you feel is sort of your inspiration? Is, do you design for, and there's really two questions here, do you design to the muse and the inspiration or do you design for the woman? Oh my, that's a beautiful question, Kathy. First of all, Mother Nature is my ultimate muse. I mean, there is so much brilliance within nature to inspire an artist. Anybody that's bored, I just never understand that. Anybody that's, that's blocked from creativity, I don't understand. It's so infinite and so exquisite. And so in my later career, I found that flora and fauna is just, I'm possessed and I can't wait to do another flower and I can't wait to make another creature and I can't wait to learn about that creature. Like I'm, I've just finished a morning cloak uh, butterfly which is from uh, the state of Montana's butterfly and I'm using Montana sapphires oh on the goodness. wings and uh, doing some heritage pieces for our nation. And I, uh, this morning cloak is so fascinating and it's morning as an M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, not it comes in the morning. And it survives in the winter. Oh it feeds goodness. on sap. And then when it folds its wings, 
it looks like a mourning cloak. It falls to the earth and that's its stealth. It looks like a leaf on the ground. I can feel your design. I can see that's so fascinating. So that, I'd say, nature is my, my ultimate muse. But yes, I design for the woman. I always do. I design, I always tell people, I work with bones. I work with bones, eye shape, color, proportion, the golden mean hair highlights. I teach the art of adornment. I love to teach it and teach people what I feel to, to, to do, be, do analyze your colors, your bones, how to lift your cheekbones. I can make a, a facelift happen and there's no surgery. I mean, really with the right colors, the right Isn't angles. That interesting? Yeah. Do you find there's a change in the consumer's want from, say, a consumer of 10 years ago to a consumer of today? Oh, absolutely. What, what do you see? Wow. Well, um, I think a lot of women, I'm thinking of women first, because the men count, but the, the, the women... We like jewelry so much more. Yeah, and men <laughs> love jewelry on their women so often, yes. which is very nice. But I say that we're so empowered as women, but we also have this internet going on, and we're so connected with culture and time. I think that the 21st century woman can do whatever she wants and does, and that's including mixing it up. I mean, I can wear a strand of pearls with my jeans and it just be totally fine. I can do whatever I want. I can take a vintage piece and place it, you know, and women are really honoring that part of them. I say that women were born to be jeweled. And I really believe that. We bear fruit. We, we bring children into this world. We are incredible. And so I think we should be honored as such. So when you think about that, what was the most, your most favorite piece that you ever designed? Thinking oh of your God. children, because I'm sure each There's piece is children like a children. again. Oh, I don't want to upset Set right the... up for that question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My favorite piece. I would have to say it's the last piece I've done. Um, is always going to be my favorite piece because I reach for those challenges. But oh my God, I did a bitterroot flower this year. It's the, again the state flower of Montana. And I used all Montana sapphires in pinks and yellows. And the stamens are 3D. It, it's, it's so gorgeous. And I was told by my suppliers, Good luck to you, Paula. If you want to do another flower this size with this many pinks and yellows, especially the pinks, you're going to have to wait 20 years. That's how rare and incredible the pinks are. And they're right from the state of Montana. There are, th Is there that are four right? mines there. That, Is that right? Yeah, it's wonderful. How, how, you know, that's a great question. How much gemstones come from the United States? Well, we have a lot of different gems, but, you know, prolific amounts come in huge in quantities and qualities will come from a lot of other places right. on the globe but we do have um, we do have those those are smaller mines they're not large like some of the sapphire mines in Africa as you know and um, other places but we do have garnets we have we have lemon opal, which is a rare form of opal, that when the French discovered it, they thought that was the only location, and it turns out right in Idaho, we have lemon opal, for example. Mm -hmm. We have tourmaline that the Empress Dowager had to, took out by tonnage when she, the last Empress of China, adored it. The rubellite tourmaline is the, considered to be one of the luckiest stones on earth by the Chinese custom. And she was taking and making even watermelon tourmaline slices as buttons on the Manchurian oh robes gosh. and things like that. But they took out tonnage from our Southern California mines oh in that time period. Now, fast forward to today, when the sleeping dragon awakened and the economy was right, they cleaned out. My Asian supplier had an eight year backstock supply of the finest tourmaline that he could gather, it all went in an hour, paid in cash. Whoa. This happened- To where? To China. To China. And yeah, the Chinese, and this, this was all happening in about four to five years ago, where um, they came into our largest gem and mineral show in Tucson that happens every year. 
and our top suppliers there who had whole showcases of the finest tourmaline the world has to offer because American buyers have been king for a long time. This is shifting mm. and it shifted at one point during George's reign in, in that era where the Japanese had that same leverage and really kind of destroyed the market for the Americans for a while yeah. in certain materials that they coveted. Mm -hmm. The Japanese, it was pink sapphires and crystal barrels, but the Chinese, it's tourmaline. And they have bought so much. They bought whole showcases of them at our shows. Oh my gosh. And this, these are, these are t long, take a long time to collect that type of quality and quantity in the material. So needless to say, tourmaline shot up like crazy. Now the, term, uh, the Chinese have a lot of it and they're not selling it as quickly as they thought. But that is another question that you didn't ask me. <laughs> That's okay. I think this is interesting, don't you? I mean, I learn something every time. You know, you've won a lot of awards. What's the most, what award that you, have you won that you think is the one you were the most treasured? Oh, gosh. Let's see. Well. And of course, I'm going to ask you, how did you win it? What got you to win it? All right, well, I'll just tell you three because I can't say one. Okay. <laughs> and they're for different reasons. That's okay. I won the best use in color from the American Gem Traders Association this year. And that is, when you get a best in, that's, that's like the best in. So that's a great one. And that really, I treasure that, and that's my most recent award. But um, I also got the Women's Jewelry Association Award in Design, and that meant a lot to me because that's women for women, and it, it just made me feel really appreciated by my industry and my fellow female in the industry, so that felt great. And then, um, what's another one? Well, I guess that's enough. And what was the other part of the question? I'm going to actually ask you something different, okay. since you answered that so perfectly. Thank you. You know, I want to go back to, is there challenges today in politics or environments? You know, the weather has changed so much, mm -hmm. the storms. Do you find that that affects you in finding gemstones? Does it affect the market? It doesn't affect you because you're now not hunting, but you must go to suppliers. Right, absolutely. And this Tell is us a little bit about politics and environment. Okay. I'll start with Tanzania for a moment because it's not just now. I think this is something that's centuries old. We do have a crescendo of weather change and that type of thing at this moment and instant in time in our, our decade or our either, even our quarter century. But in Tanzania, there were vast floods. And uh, my, my dear friend, Campbell Bridges, who was killed by the Maasai, mm. who founded both Savarite Garnet and Tanzanite, he owned the mine rights, and that's a long story, but, uh, and I'm di digressing, but um, he founded these minerals and took Tanzanite to Tiffany's, and that's when the name was co coined Tanzanite. So that blue is so beautiful and had not been out on the market ever. It was a new min mineral, like you said. Oh, do these happen? Yes, they do. And then they, there's an explosion and there was great supply, for decent pricing, and then the floods happened. It shot out of the roof. These people were out of jobs and work. There was no way to work. So it affects a whole population and then it affects the whole globe the whole when it trickles down, yeah. And so uh, I'm just thinking of Tanzania is the first thing that came to my mind. But we also have politics, like in Burma, we have a ban on both jade and ruby in our country from Burma because of their political treatment of their peoples. And so we cannot import it. And we can, we can use existing material right, that's in this yeah. country, but it is totally banned. So that's how our country will deal with uh, certain countries that that is a large part of their gross national product. So yes, that's where politics come into that play. And then we have, you know, the blood diamonds, of course, that's been a very big yeah. factor now that we've had even a Brad Pitt movie on this and all of that's gone on, we have a lot of change. And we have Americans who are extremely dedicated that do go to Washington, that are highly active, and people who do go to Madagascar and set up schools. 
I'm very proud of who we are in my small industry. The, the, we're very awake yeah. and we care. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot of change that's gone on in that industry. You think about just that little sliver mm -hmm. of stones, all of the political noise. Right. Yeah, people know. They ask the questions, where are the stones mined? Do you consider, you know, there's a lot of volatility in the markets today, mm -hmm. the stock markets, the investment markets. Clearly, the real estate market was a giant hiccup some Huge. years ago. Huge. People don't really know if that hiccup's going to come back. People right. continue to be worried about the stock market. The stock market's going to have a, a problem in the next few years. Indicators say it's not, but there's always, I guess if you knew that in 2008, you would have sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Would you consider gemstones an investment and kind of take us back a few years and say, how, how much have gemstones valued? How much has mm -hmm. their value grown? And do, do you see that that will be a continuing trend? I have to answer that on a lot of levels Good. because I have to go back to where uh, people were buying gemstones and, as an investment and the government got uh, into it because there were some things going on that weren't so pretty in that relationship. And so that changed how a person in my standing and our, like the American Gem Traders and that type of industry group had to make a certain decision that how you do this is very important and what does that really mean? Well, what I can tell you is that I have pieces, like I have a, an orange spinel ring that I decided not to sell because it was rare in my time of procuring it, which was in the early, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And it was of, of size, you know, you have a five carat stone, it is considered um, worthy of collecting. You know, they jump in price once they hit that five carat level in, in 10 and on and on. But I kept that for all these years and I was asking a friend of mine, how much would that stone cost today? They said, if you could find one, Paula, if you could, and I, I called all over the world, I literally did, because I have you know, connections all over the globe, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And I mean, that was it, from 1978 or 81 and 2015. I can't tell you the leap that that played, but also, in my case, I'm doing something a little differently too. I'm making one-of-a-kind pieces. They're original works, so there's a provenance in that in itself. You, you can't, never mind you can't get the stone, you can't get that piece. It's a one-of-a-kind. It's a one-of-a-kind, so I'm doing fine art. Did the, did the economy in, in impact our business? Yes. And my brilliant Martin, who's such a visionary, and I'm such a conservative, despite appearances, I know, but I really am conservative. <laughs> and um, I, I'm just very practical with money and things. And Martin was saying to me, before 2008, he was going, you know, you've got to invest in major works. And I'm like, I can't are you crazy? You know, wanting me to spend so much money on this one when I can get 12 of these? And what are you saying? And who am I going to sell it to? But he kept saying, Paul, you've got to do this. And then the only way he so could... Did you take his advice? Well, it took him longer. But what, what, what tipped me, uh, was the tipping point for me to say, you know what, you're right. He said, haven't you ever noticed your best and finest work sells first? And I thought, well, that makes sense. So I dove in, but I still thought we were a little crazy. And I kept going, and 2008 happens, everything collapses, and then I was selling out. And then that continued, that ripple happened, and then what happened was um, nowadays, well also I was able to help people that might have gone out of business. And then designers during this collapse, great designers, brilliant designers, they went into silver. And do you remember that period? And I, I, I don't, I can't work in silver. I mean, I because I can't wear it. I don't look good in white metal. But in case I'm stuck with all my jewelry, I gotta wear it. So anyway, being a little facetious there. <laughs> but I will tell you, I didn't, didn't, I didn't go into the fear, and to this moment in time, it's harder for me to sell a piece 
that is not a masterwork oh, than it is to sell these masterworks because of what's going on as you pointed out, all those different layers of the economy and the structures. And by the way, history shows that portable wealth can be very handy yeah, in saving lives. So, you and know, we have a wonderful guest here tonight. What piece of advice would you give them in looking to buy a gem? Well, or a stone, or mm -hmm. you know, you know, we have all the like magnifying glass and things like that. But what, what would you know? Let's. We'd love to give them the golden nugget. Every time I interview, what's mm -hmm. the golden nugget that you can take home with you? What would this one be? I would say, first of all, a reputable dealer is is essential, and in our country, we have stores that are called AGS stores. That's American Gem Society stores that your gem traders such as the American Gem Traders Association because we have bylaws that we stand by and you know as in any country you have to know where you are buying from and also you want to read up you can read up you can empower yourself you can get on the internet and find out the characteristics and quality uh, qualities of these particular minerals but what would I encourage you to invest in I would say some of the rarest and finest of any gem category. That's what my late George always did. And he said, in this business, you have to have a strong fist. You, t you, you buy a lot, you take the finest, you put it away. And that's that orange spinel, for example. But there are such rare, fine materials coming out right now from the likes of Madagascar and other areas, but Madagascar has got some really great pieces coming out, Brazil. There's just a lot of beautiful stones coming out there. Some things are ubiquitous, and some things will still hold their value. But for me, if I were investing in a gemstone, I would pick something rare, subtle, and beautiful, and almost unattainable, and, and get the best you can afford. And I don't think it would let you down. So you're a friend of the Golden Door. I you adore. Love your work. I adore. What's the next Door. for Paula? I know I'll be working, but passionately, and I will be giving as much from my soul to the beauty of what I do because nothing pleases me more than bringing more beauty into the world and to create jobs. I, I, I that's one of the things I'm most proud of, that this little person, that was born in the South and you know, had great parents behind her that loved her unconditionally, so anything was possible, yes. that I can create jobs and I'm still doing that. That's magical. I hope you enjoyed our conversation tonight. I hope you found it fun. I always learn something. Every single time I sit here, I learn something new. You had great and questions. I hope you all learned something. Just a little bit about gemstones and things like that and about the fabulous Thank you. Thank you.